guys hear me okay? No? Now? Did you Am I screaming at you? A little bit? No, I'm okay? All right. Um, what a fascinating time to be in the restaurant industry. And, and I'm going to talk about a little, some of the realities we're facing and, uh, and where we go from there. Why is this number so important to restaurants? How many people here own a restaurant or manage a restaurant? It's about everybody. Why is this number so important to us? If anyone can tell me. You're my staff. You're cheating. What's that? That is the average percentage of labor cost um, in, in restaurants. So I grew up in family restaurants. We had uh, restaurants down in Puyallup. My uncle used to try to intimidate the crap out of me by talking to me about the business around the shopping block. And whenever he disagreed with me, the knife would go harder. Um, and he told me back then that the basic model in the industry is a third, a third, and 30. 30 a third labor, a third food, 30% everything else. That changed in 1998, between 1998 and 2001, when the minimum wage started going up. And really for the past 15 years now, we've been running at 36, 30, and 30. Now these are averages. The average American is 5'10". Yeah, I'm not. Doesn't mean I'm not American, it just means I'm not the average. So some of you will be higher, some of you will be lower, that's great. But that's really what's, what's been happening. Now, what's gonna face this 36%, Bruce talked about the minimum wage increase, Good, bad, and different, love it or hate it, scream, cry, cuss, there's gonna be a big minimum wage increase coming this coming year. And we can all argue the economics of it and all probably agree, but I'm telling you it's raining. We gotta buy an umbrella. We gotta figure out how we're gonna deal with the rain. We're facing a labor shortage. The generation that is retiring is about 22% less or more than the generation coming in. So there's a lot of people leaving and saying, CNR, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in the restaurants having the bar. I'm not going to be running them on the front side. I'm gone. And the generation that's coming in is a lot smaller. So we're going to have fewer workers available to us. That's just a reality. The new federal overtime laws are coming into effect, and they're going to impact how we pay cooks and how we run our 40-hour cooks and our 60-hour cooks and, and all those kind of things in the back. Uh, the health care mandate, which immediately following me is Sherry. I know it's been in effect. and like, well, it's not been a big take-up rate but the penalties are going to start increasing and the take up rate is going to start increasing more and more. The penalty in 2018 becomes $900. All of a sudden employees who didn't care are now going to start caring and they're going to start taking it. Leave mandates are coming into effect. I'm just calling in one big group leave mandates. There's about six of the different ones that require how you take paid sick leave, maternity leave, family leave, whatever kind of leave. And then Bruce talked about the restrictive scheduling that's coming on board in Seattle that's already passed in San Francisco and is the next wave of minimum wages. Holy crap. It's a lot. So I want to all bow our heads for a moment and say goodbye to the business model as we know it. It's passing away. We can be sad. It's been a good 10-year run once we figure this stuff out, but the reality is these things change the way we do business now. How many people read um, uh, the uh, book Good to Great? A couple of you. One of my favorite top five management books. It's a great management book, but one of them talks about Admiral, um, oh, I'm listening to the name, Admiral Stockton, um, when he was captured and he was in prison and there was no way for him to escape. And, and basically he was doomed. And, and how did you survive all those years in prison camp and not being able to move forward? And he's like, I faced the brutal reality. I'm here. That's my reality. But God damn it, I'm gonna live. Screw them, I'm gonna get through this and I'm gonna figure out how. So he faced the brutal reality of I'm here. But he also had the courage and the strength to say, but they're not gonna get me, I'm gonna win. And that is undeniable and I'm not backing out of that. To some degree, our industry has got to face these facts. And if we do that, we're not looking necessarily a glass half full of the death of the old business model. We got to look at how there's going to be a new business model moving forward. And I know it sounds Pollyannish, but there will be restaurants tomorrow, I swear to God. In fact, if you look at the generations coming in, with all those things happening in the worst case scenario, I would bet my car there will be more restaurants tomorrow than today, percentage-wise. They're just going to be different. Different can be bad, different can be scary. It's not the way you know how to do business, but they'll be there. Because the generations that are coming in 
don't want to eat out for a special kind of occasion. They want to eat out because they're hungry. The generation, my generation and upward, when we were young, why did we eat out? It was my Yaya's birthday. It was my sister's ballet recital. I finally got a hit in baseball, and I absolutely suck at baseball, so my parents were rewarding me. We went out for a special occasion. Today you go out because it's Thursday. That generation wants to eat out seven, eight, nine times a week. The generation that's leaving wants to eat out three times a week. There will be restaurants. What we have to do is buck up and figure out how they're going to be different. Because the business and the customers and the people are going to be there. Yes, some of the awesome ways to use the business are going to have to go away, and I understand that's hard. But on a birth announcement, do you usually cry at a birth? Or do you just celebrate, hey, this is the fun stuff. Remember when you first opened a restaurant and there was all those challenges of, oh my God, my liquor license is late and the contractor is late and this menu item isn't ready and I can't figure out my pricing? We're starting that process again. So if we get up and we look at it like Admiral Stockton did, we're going to survive it. Heck with them, we're going to figure it out. We will. So what I want to talk about, is this interesting stuff? I'm on general track. I'm sure I pissed some of you off, but that's okay. Um, I want to talk about buzzes. Why am I calling them buzzes? I'm in a trade association. I can't tell you what to do. And if you're anything like my dad, you're all type A's, you wouldn't listen to me anyway. So what I'm going to do for you is just simply give you ideas of what's buzzing out there. Some of these could be right for your business. Some of them may spark a second or third idea. And next year's presentation will be a different buzz because it sparked an idea for you. So I'm no way promoting these. I'm just saying these are conversations that are occurring a lot out there. Enough where I've elevated them that I think people ought to think about them. And that's it. Does that make sense? So one of the things that has been occurring from 1998 to 2001, we saw about a 70% reduction of bussers. Uh, if we're having to pay our servers $15 or some really high number, the reality is the mix of table mix and the weight mix of those things and being able to afford busters at that higher rate, a lot of people are saying, well, this is just probably the end of that position. And a lot of people are having conversations. Some of you are already there, and you're like, yeah, that happened three years ago, thanks. A lot of people still have just fewer buses out there, maybe busters for four servers versus busters for every two. I think the reality is a lot of people are asking themselves, do I still need this position if I have these kind of salaries? Another buzz out there, and I think we're all hearing everything about it, is the no tipping buzz. Um, and that has gathered a lot of national media, a lot of conversation here locally. I'll bet you I've talked to over 150 restaurateurs who've told me they are looking at over the next three or four years or even the next six months, go ahead and taking this big step of eliminating tipping. And I'm going to put a couple things in the tipping box because no one knows the right answer. Everyone's thinking about this. So there's the idea of no tipping. There's the idea of service charges and everything that goes with service charges. There's the idea of tip pooling because there's going to be one more challenge in that ninth District Court case on tip pooling before it's done, but a lot of people like the idea, if it actually becomes legal, to really aggressively use tipping on, on balancing the front of the house and the back of the house, because at the end of the day, that's our big struggle. Um, <clears throat> there's the Ivers model. You guys have all read about Ivers. I, I want to give them credit. They got out there and they tried something new and different, and they're learning. <laughs> and when you try out, you're the first one out of the gate. The, uh, you learn all those things first, and they are learning. I think if Bob Donegan, the CEO of Ivers, were up here and said he's learned a lot from this model. Are people familiar with it, or do they want me to go over some of the five basic tenets of it? Everyone's, everyone not familiar with it? All right. Not familiar with it? The, the basic tenets of, of Ivers' model is, is no tipping. Uh, they increased their prices 22%. They went with a uh, um, commission model. They raised everybody to 15 and uh, there was one other element. And I can get an article. If you're interested in the article that explains it all, I'd love to get it to you. Just, so the ideas are generating on how you deal, deal with it. Um, initially, they, went, they took the tip right off the, uh, the line item. So if you had paid with a credit card, you couldn't do it. After about four months, they brought it back. And so now they say, don't tip. You don't have to tip. Really don't tip. But the line is on there in case you really don't want to listen to us. You want to tip anyway. But their tipping is averaging way less than it ever did before. Really what they're finding is out of, out of state area, people are still tipping, and the in-state people, so it's not like they're averaging 6%. It's all or nothing, it tends to be what the range of what the average tipping is. Uh, face pricing realities. Uh, can I tell you one of my favorite 
personal restaurant stories. I grew up in the restaurant business. I slept in my mom's office most of my life um, while she did payroll and she did all that stuff. And about every five years, my dad would have to raise menu prices. Think about that for a second, every five years. And he, we had this huge orange ashtray when it used to be okay to smoke in front of your kids and not get slaughtered and be called a child abuser. And he'd have like three packs of Pell-Mells. I don't even know if they make that red brand of things anymore. And he'd steal every menu in the Piala Valley. If you had a restaurant in Piala Valley, my dad had copies of it. He stole it, he stuck it in my pants, he headed to my sister's coat. We stole everyone's menu because he used to not be able to look it up online. And he would spend two weeks trying to figure out what the new menu prices would be. And he'd swear in Greek, he'd get up and he'd drive down to another restaurant and steal their menu because he wasn't sure customers would pay it. And then finally he would introduce the new restaurant prices at Antone's. And that first customer would come in and say something and he would just bl ballistically blow up. But over time he found out, well, people will pay higher prices. Our reality is we can't just keep our prices the same and live under the new model. So we have to face pricing realities. I know it sucks. I know it causes ulcers. I know it's not the fun thing to do but we have to face our pricing realities. And then lastly, we have to embrace technology. I've never met a restaurateur who got into the restaurant business because they love tech. Still haven't met that person. In fact, most restaurateurs got into it because they get to hate tech and still be in business. Reality is, we are the state's largest private employer almost by any measurement. And yet we're the last industry to try to figure out how tech can make us more efficient. And the time has come where we have to face the reality of how do we make tech make us more efficient. Whether it's through really cool uh, inventory systems that are coming on or really cool systems that allow our, whether it's hot schedules, I know for some of you like been doing hot schedules for a couple years, a lot of the industry hasn't, or things like it. How do I use my phone to do my scheduling? How do I do other things to make my life easier and finally embrace technology? The time has come where we gotta look at those things and see if that can't shave off some points in how we do business. So those are the things I'm hearing about the most on the full service side. I had a quick question. How many in the audience are full service restaurants? How many in the audience are quick service restaurants? Okay, got a mix of both. So I'm gonna go over some quick service side too because I think they both apply to, to the other ideas. On the quick service side, I'm hearing a lot of simplify. Simplify, simplify, simplify. If you have a very complicated menu, you need more employees to make it work. If you have a simple menu and we have somebody really well trained to do it, they can be more efficient. So I know some people are playing with the idea of getting more and more complicated, but I think the on the ground operators I'm hearing about are how do I simplify so I can be efficient with fewer people? And how do I cut down on my inventory costs and my other things by simplifying? Electronic ordering, one, efficiency. So you are hearing all kinds of things out there about kiosks and how do I use kiosks and can kiosks make me more efficient? And I think that buzz is certainly out there. If I were a betting man, but this is just my bet, I'm not telling you what to do, why would we invest in tech that we had to maintain when our employees were voluntarily buying these at $700 a pop and they get updated on their own and apps all the time? And so if I were a betting man, I'm listening to the buzz and I'm talking to the tech people, which I am, um, if I'm going to uh, Cafe Siena and I'm going to be there at 12, I could text in my order, get a confirmation and pay for it on my phone and walk in and say, hey, my, my code name is Antone555 and like, here's your, here's your lunch, thanks, you're already paid. Or if I come in through the drive-thru, I can say, I can pull up the first run and say, hi, my passcode is X, here, drive up the second window, here, I'm gone and I've taken care of it. And when there's a problem with a cell phone, there's a problem with a cell phone. When there's a problem with a kiosk, my entire business is now in chaos. And so if I were a betting man, this development, because employees are willingly spending the amount of tech that goes into these things, is probably where the future is headed. Either way, electronic ordering, whatever wins, whatever comes out, whether it's Betamax or VCR, this is going this direction. And so how do we get more efficient at it. Thanks for getting that joke. The rest of them didn't really get that one. Um, am I generally on track? Is this good stuff? Yeah? Anyone disagree? You can flip me off now. Okay, no one flip me off. Um, second order, banking. I think this is a fascinating, it's okay to leave. 
The, uh, the second order is banking. If you look at what Starbucks did, I think that's the edge of what's coming. Where how many people have like prepaid their Starbucks cards on here, gone in and bought their Starbucks, and then left? What if the bank charges were all on the customer? What if you were negotiating all of that 3 to 4%, which by the way is probably, I always say banks make as much money in restaurants as restaurant owners do. What if we could inverse the idea of that and we could control the banking side by controlling how our customers pay through this? Is that part of our future? Starbucks, I think, is blazing away that over the next five to seven years, we us ought to watch that and be aware of that and see where it's going and learn from it. I think it's a buzz that you ought to take in mind and keep an eye on as we move forward. Rethink the perfect employee. I think this is a huge one. I think a lot of times we think of our employees as they showed up every day, so they're hired. Sometimes it's not always the case, but I think a lot of the times that's the case. How do we rethink our employees? Who is the perfect employee for my type of business? And at 15, 16, 17, 18 bucks, who can do the work of four? How many have had a server who was just a phenomenal server that could do the work of three other servers? We gotta find them. And we gotta figure out who they are. Because they are gonna become worth gold at higher rates. And so, how do we invest in training? How do we invest in our people? How do we stagger our lunch shifts? to rethink who we hire. I think that's a big part of our conversations. Find a way to be local. This is a big, gener that's got a big echo, I'll stand up here. This is a big generational change. We have studied a lot about generational changes coming into our industry. And one of the biggest ones is this generation wants to feel the things they spend their money are their community. So, how do you find a way to tag into what's a core belief of this new generation? This generation wants to buy from you nine times a week versus three times a week. They're gonna buy who they relate to. How do you promote the local beers, the local wines, well, this is quick service, the local produce? How do you make yourself, if you're a national brand, feel like you care about your community? How are you local? Don't blow this off. This is a generational, mind shift of how people approach their buying power, how do you relate to them on a local level? Again, face pricing realities, same for every sector. You can't, the old Carl, not Karl Marx, Groucho Marx, that was a Freudian slip, the old Groucho Marx philosophy of I'm losing money on every sale but I'm gonna make it up on volume, didn't work in the 1930s and it doesn't work now, we've gotta face these pricing realities. And then um, inside, outside employment ladders, uh, talking about this one real quickly, as you have different communities in different areas, can you hire into your busier restaurants? Can you train at your slower restaurants that are outside of an area, and then your, your restaurants where you really make money, can you move, can that be your ladder? And can you go inside, outside shifts, restaurants, or find partners? So think about finding a partner that, um, if you have a cafe and you have a fine dining restaurant and you're looking for really qualified cooks and you can only go up to a certain level, how do you work together to create inside outside employment ladders so, peop ladders so people are moving up? There's a lot of people thinking about how do they find that career ladder in a different world. And then how am I doing on time? Because I want to leave you guys enough time to blister in the, oh, I'm doing really good. Look at that. Am I going too fast? Things I want to talk about for all of us uh, to think about what other segment of the industry you're in. Stop ignoring politics and engage. And I know that's a simple one, uh, but the reality is the minimum wage, Bruce talked about some of them. There was an announcement on Thursday that the cities of Edwood, Edmonds, uh, oh God, I'm going to get it wrong. I should look it up on my phone. Edmonds, Mount Lake Terrace, uh, Long, okay. four local cities in Snohomish are now looking at doing their own minimum wage. I had 18 on my watch list, now I have 23 on my watch list. The Washington State Restaurant Association can't watch every city council in the state. We just can't. You need to get to know who your mayor is, you need to get to know who your city council people are, you need to be relevant in your community, and I know you probably hate politics just like you hate tech and maybe social media, but we gotta deal with these things. And we need you, we're imploring you to get engaged on the local level. Consider outsourcing non-core functions. 
I've heard from so many people, I just want to make this. I am passionate about the product that I am making. I could care less about healthcare. No offense, Sherry, wherever you are. Uh, I could care less about healthcare. I didn't get into the restaurant business to become an expert on the ACA. I got into the restaurant business because I love people and I have a dream, right? And so if you got into the business for that reason, what are the non-core functions that you're spending your hours on that you can outsource? So you can focus on the things you have to, whether it's HR, whether it's accounting, whether it's tech, whether it's how to imply these things. What can you outsource? Social media, so you can focus on food, great customer service, and great employees. Because at the end of the day, that's where you need to be. The rest of the stuff is crap that's gonna hurt you. So how do we find resources? How do we find ways to help each other get out of those non-core functions? Be transparent. Like I said, our business model as we know it today is dead. It's just a matter of time. Sometime in 2016, sometime in 2017, the way we do business, no longer. We will have a new business model. Be open about it. Don't hide it. Don't blame people you hate for it. Just be open. I have to change. This is the way I have to change. Your employees need to know because they're going to be communicating to your employees. At the end of the day, your employees talk to your customers more than, they, than you do. And they build a bond with your customers more than you do. Sorry, that's just true. <coughs> if they hate you, it will come across to the customer and that loyalty will come across to the customer. Be transparent on the changes you're making and how you're talking about them. <coughs> Embrace millennials. I said this at the opening. I'm going to say it and say it and say it. And every time I get in front of you guys to talk, millennial generation thinks radically different than the generation that's leaving. And I know we hear about it all the time, but I really want you to think about how. They go out because they're hungry. So if you're going out nine times every week, are you eating at the same place every night? You're eating differently. But if you're part of a community of restaurants, that that's where we go and now let's figure out if we feel like Thai or ribs or steak or this or how does this work? Think about how you react to someone who's eating out nine times a week. Think about being local. Think about being in favor of the things that they're in favor of and how you relate to them. Think about social media. A lot of these things I know are not why you got in business, but these are the customers that are coming in and they're gonna act differently. And explore community employment ladders. Um, one of the things that really came true to me you know, when we were working in the city of Seattle and we did on their $15 an hour minimum wage, I know this is obvious, but sometimes it's hard to see the obvious when you're going too fast. The quick service folks wanted to say, we are the trainers of tomorrow. These people are getting their very first job, their very first experience. They're, they're coming out of tough life situations or they're teenagers. We're teaching them the basics. We should be rewarded for really engaging people to get their start in business. Then you go over to the fine dining folks and they say, would you stop calling us first time jobs? These are careers. Our servers are making $80,000 a year. Our kitchen managers are making 65. We're proud of that. They should make more. These are careers. The reality is our industry has ladders that go this way. You might start at the counter here and then you might move to a cafe or you might move to assistant manager and then you go like this in different ways. How do we start working together on our workforce and what does that start looking like? Um, we have to figure this out together because we're, we're not gonna wake up tomorrow. How many people have been short of a line cook this year? I thought that had been 100%. Then how on earth do they find examples of people who've been the counters of fast food places for four years? Why, have, why is there a glut here and a shortage here? How do we build that ladder? How do we get people to come through and grow? So I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions because talking about a new business model is scary and new and, and I didn't just want to talk at you. So ask me, ask me some questions. I, grill me where you think I'm wrong because I'd like to get better for my next presentation as well. Yes. So what do I think the, fifth, uh, the impact of the $15, are we, can you grab a mic? It's right there. Right there. Yeah, yeah, pass the speaker, it'll explode on you. <laughs> if nothing else, can you... I'm going to jump down and I'll walk around. Oh, okay. 
Mm-hmm. I got exposed. Oh, you can't. You get it work? Sorry about that. Here we go. So the, the question was, uh, what do I think the impact of the minimum wage or all these things is going to be on the 36%? My best estimate from back of the napkin work is the collection of that initial things that I showed you is about nine points. So you add up all those things, so you're, that's without changes, which is silly. Life changes all the time. That's assuming no price increases. I'll walk back out front, try not to screech on you. Um, assuming nothing changes, we'd have to find nine points in our business model. Whether that's a couple points through pricing increases or labor changes or something, somewhere we gotta find about nine points just to stay even. Let's see if we can get the mic to work now. It's working? There we yeah. go. Yeah. We're, we're from out of state, but I wanna ask you about how's, how's the um, Ivers uh, working for the Ivers themselves in general because 22% is pretty high. So um, I will do my best I can to do a Bob Donegan impression. Okay. Ultimately, I, I would rather have him speak for him, but here's my impression of what's going on. My guess is he'd probably say to you five things. His turnover has been zero. So the first thing you worry about is your servers leaving you in mass. And he's, he's lost one server that he doesn't believe was because of that, real, that person. So his turnover has been zero. Um, remember that Ivers has two full service restaurants and they've been ripping up the entire waterfront down there. So it's hard to judge that. But his other restaurant relatively is going, hasn't seen a change and the impact is good. And so he, but he's not Pollyannish. I think he'd say, right now there's cranes all over the city of Seattle and there's a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand dollar jobs moving into the city. What's going to happen when the economy is slower? I haven't tested that, that yet. I don't know. And so he would tell you it is working well, but he also would be open with, we yet to gone through a time where the customers tighten up and what happens then. So he's very honest with that. Um, and then I also would think he would tell you he, why he thinks it's working well is they over communicated with the employees and they continue to over communicate with employees constantly. Um, his other experiment is initially there was nothing on that credit card line and after four months they brought it back, which tells you they're aware of, they're keeping an eye on it, they're gonna to have to keep adjusting and keep adjusting to make this work. Did that answer your question? Yeah, my adjustments, yeah. My adjustments, how's he make credit card adjustment? How's he made the credit card adjustment? Well, on the... Oh, well the initial adjustment was he removed the tip line from the bill completely. So you couldn't tip at all. Then after four months, he put the line back on, but said right underneath it, you don't need to do this, but if you really, really want to, here it is. Sorry, is he thinking of changing the rate that he charges? The 22% increase? Yes. I'm just trying to think of what I can say and, and not get too far out over my skis. I think like all of us, he is keeping an eye on his customer's reaction to price and what he needs to do to stay in business. The 22%, I don't think was his final change of how he does business, and I think he's going to keep an eye on it. Is anyone here from Ivers that could correct that if it's wrong? No? Okay. I think that's probably is. I think they're keeping an eye on all of that. And again, this is in a red-hot economy in the city of Seattle. Are there other restaurants that have started no-tip policy like Tom Douglas and I think the Ram? Are they using the 22%? I, I think there's a, there is... So in 1998, when the minimum wage in Washington took its first massive leap, there were about 150, 200 ideas about what was going to work. And it took about three years for, for it to start shifting out. And the customer is saying, I like this one, I don't like this one, I don't like that one, this one's kind of cool. And all of us have, are great and smart, and we're testing it out. I think we're in that testing phase. And so um, none of these things are exactly the same. All of them are trying things, and they're all kind of keeping an eye across the street. I think the reality is, is this will be tested strongly over the next three to four years, and we'll start seeing successors start rising to the top. So it's really early. The Ram and Tom Douglas, the two that you mentioned, just happened. And, and you don't try something immediately and change it overnight. You, you let it get tested. And I think they're letting it get tested. Anyone from Ram or Tom Douglas would disagree with that in the audience? Okay. Here and then here. 
Um, you, you mentioned briefly the ninth uh, court appeal the case. The tip ruling, you know, yes. Do you, do you have an idea of when you think they'll start enforcing the verdict there, or if they will? I, I think um, the answer is, I think, and you're not going to love the answer, to watch your magazine in May. So we filed our appeal, the, the, your membership magazine. We filed our appeal. If they accept our appeal, um, it's one answer. If they deny our appeal, it's a different answer. And so I think the answer for immediate use, I, and I know you'd like something more succinct, but I think that's probably the most honest, is we should have a good feel of if did they accept our appeal, and if they did accept our appeal, at what level and what does that mean? So I think May is a good time to check in. Jason, you're with me, my counterpart in Oregon. Did that sound right? Yeah. So, yeah, good, good point. Uh, there's a few, a few things to keep in mind when it comes to tip pooling. So this petition that we did with our, our friends in Washington uh, in Alaska and the National Restaurant Association, we, we don't know, we can't look into the judicial crystal ball and have any real feel as to when they're going to give us back a decision on when they're hearing our petition or not. So it's a, we're petitioning them for this rehearing uh, based on the February 23rd decision, and it could take them weeks, it could take them a month or two, and once they make their decision, if the decision is yes, we, we agree with the petition, we're gonna move forward and do a rehearing, then tip pooling is still the law of the land. If they decide to decline the petition, then we know the judicial courts will hand out, down a mandate to the US Department of Labor and they can start enforcing that within seven days. So Anthony's right, when he says check, check in May, that's good advice. I, I would check even more frequently than that though because if they get back to us earlier than May uh, and they, the decision is to decline our petition, then we're in a situation where everyone has to change in seven days, so you have to be on your game. Yeah, I would, I would add two things to that. One, assuming you're all members of the Restaurant Association, you probably wouldn't be here, um, there's a weekly news email that comes out. The magazine just comes out once a month, but there's a weekly news newsletter that comes out that will, the second that comes out, will probably be out the next day of what we learned. So to keep an eye on that. The other thing is, if we're giving you six weeks notice that this is coming, I would start thinking through my plan today. What is, what is my plan for this? And kind of have, be NASA, you know? If the, if the uh, seal is gonna break on the door, what's my, what's my backup? Be prepared for your backup. You have time to think about that between now and then. I think the next question was right up here, Roxanne. examples of the restaurants and all of them have chosen a price increase for their um, for their model for their adjustment for wages and I was wondering if they had any restaurants that had tried a different model um, that we talked about service charges we talked about a couple other things and you haven't come up with anybody that has tried that and the feedback of how that's worked uh, it's so a lot of, some people have talked about service charges but it's really early and so I think the best time to, I mean, people kind of talk, come out and said, we're looking at this service charge. There are those who've done it, but I, you almost have to give these things two, three months to get through. And, and, and really we're in that time frame still. So I would say, unless someone knows of something specific, I have seen those examples out there, but I'd hate to declare them a success or a failure until probably after three or four months of being out there. Sorry. I think people are looking at service charges very, very seriously. Um, we have, the hero manual of our, of our restaurant um, regulatory magazine has the how to do service charge and stuff. And we've been getting, I've been getting probably 10, 15 requests a week for how do I do this, how do I do this. So there's a significant amount of interest. What people do with it and what their percentage is is still in front of us. Also people are asking themselves, Seattle's got a seven year phase in for the majority of restaurants, three years for the, for the big folks, but for the majority seven years. How much of this big change do I take now? And how much of it do I take in two or three steps. So, so like, Ivers kind of ripped the bandaid. They went $15 now and did this. Others are saying, I'm going to start here, start here, and make slower adjustments as we go. Both approaches are out there. Other questions? So if I were in your shoes, the things I would watch for um, probably between now and let's say June 1st. Uh, Labor has filed their initiative. Bruce talked about it. It's for 1350 uh, over four years. And uh, top of my head is uh, uh, seven days paid sick leave with a 40 hours carryover. Um, 
if they've qualified or not, or if anything else has emerged, we're gonna probably know that by June 1. They got $10 million, it's probably qualifying, it would be my guess. Um, if it does qualify, I would probably start preparing my business plan for that to be out there, um, and we can go from there. Uh, that would be one I would watch for. The second thing I would watch for is the tip pooling announcements. I think that is gonna be definitely out there and going. And then I would watch for tech. I know we don't love it. I know there's a lot of challenges for it, but what are the technologies that can save me one or two points here and one or two points there? Uh, and really, how do you embrace that? And, and where do those conversations start? Really kind of depends on your business. Um, but really start asking yourself as you're walking around, what are the tech solutions that can save me a point? And then lastly, social media. So for all the things I've talked about that feel like negative, I'm gonna bring you back to my opening point. There's going to be restaurants tomorrow and in 2020 and in 2025. I know everyone wants me to say that this minimum wage is the death of restaurants. I'm not gonna say it because it's just not true. They're just going to be different. And so with that, they're going to be different, not because we are, ch are setting the market, it's because the millennials are gonna dine far more than the people who are retiring in mass. And so how do you make them your future? How do you get them to come out? What does that look like? What is my social media? How do I relate to them locally? I have a lot of negatives and I recognize from a business perspective when you, you're talking about a four point margin and a nine point hit, there's a lot of emotion that goes with it, but there's a lot of good that's coming as well. So I'm available for questions. Our booths are right over here. I'll be here uh, next two days. Uh, our mission is to help you succeed. And so whatever we can do to do that, uh, please, please let us know. Last chance for questions, anything for me? Help me get better. How many people felt this was a good use of their time? Thank you very much. Uh, we, impact, we are passionate about the restaurant business. I just posted something on my Facebook the other day. My grandfather, when he first came to this country from Greece, worked on the railroads and realized he didn't want to work for anyone else anymore. And he opened a little cafe in Tacoma. And then that allowed my dad to then one day start his restaurants. And so I've got, I get really passionate about restaurants for that reason. And so I hope you're as passionate about this industry as I am. So thank you for everything. Have a great show and have a great weekend. Good luck with your new business models.